As you can see from my title, I'll be discussing the transition of muscle to meat and briefly reviewing the energy metabolism and oxidative processes underlying this transition. You can see I have three co-authors on this paper, and there's a couple points I want to make with this. Um, none of us really that are at all successful operate in a vacuum. When we talk about muscle myopathies, as I'll be getting to later in my talk, you really need to acknowledge some of the groups that have really made contributions to this. The Arkansas group with Casey and, and, and Kuhn and Kudapan um, and their contributions operating to let together and collectively. Um, my co-authors here, Jess, um, Mick Wick, who's just a fantastic muscle biologist. Um, he and I have co-chaired, uh, co uh, co-advised about 10 graduate students together. Luis Marias is that ever important statistician. And so I would recommend that if you have questions over our model development later on, don't ask me. I'll give you Luis's uh, email. And then Jackie Griffin is an ever important worker bee as a graduate student. So you know you can have ideas and things, but you really need that person that really puts the, uh, the traction to things. I want to start my talk with uh, an overview of the wing and flight muscles. Um, as can be seen, the, upper, you know, the underlying supracoracoideus or the pectoral minor um, is responsible for raising the wing during the process of flight. The overlying and much larger pectoralis major uh, is the muscle that is needed for pulling the wing down during flight. And so I like this picture because it shows the ever increasing thickness in the pectoralis major and again a wild bird during the course of flight. And one of the things that's important is you can actually see in this picture the transition and the increase in thickness as the pectoralis major approaches the sternum. I worked for a major uh, broiler breeding company for five years before going to Ohio State, and I spent quite a bit of time with the uh, selection team. And back in the early days where yield was just becoming important, we used to actually be able to select for confirmation in the breast muscle. In those early days back in the mid 80s when we were trying to develop yield strain birds and improve the conformation. And so really we were very effective in improving yield, but largely while that was done in the early days by palpation because you only had a thin layer of skin over the developing pectoralis muscle. In my next slide here I just want to go through a little bit of the fiber typing that's inherent to our breast muscles. Um, basically, the pectoralis major is what we call white muscle. Uh, it's predominantly type 2B fibers, um, very, very glycolytic, very anaerobic, which is very important in post-harvest metabolism. Um, as opposed to the red muscles in the drum and the thigh, very high in myoglobin, very high in mitochondrial, mitochondrial content, and, and are very aerobic. Okay, these are the muscles that really have to work all the time versus the flight muscles in birds, which are only needed periodically. Those of you that know me realize that um, the literature is there for a reason. And so if we really want to go back through and understand the research and what's kind of contributed to where we are in the state of muscle biology today, we need to go back to some of the, the early literature. Um, George and Nake, 1958, these were the first folks that really quantified the different contribution of fibers in the, uh, the muscle of pigeons. Southard and Holtman, 1969. These are really the first folks that truly identified the mitochondria as having the complete enzyme picture, complete glyco glycolytic potential in breast muscle. Up until this time, there was contention that when you isolated mitochondria, you could actually look at glycolysis occurring. But there was some contention because people were assuming that during the process of isolating the mitochondria, some of the glycolytic enzymes were coming from other tissues that were contaminating the mitochondrial preps. So really, 69 is when we first confirmed for the first time that we were actually getting a lot of our glycolysis occurring in mitochondria and breast muscle. Uh, Rosser and George, this is probably the most heavily cited paper where basically they characterize fiber typing over multiple species. An excellent review if you're really interested in the history of muscle fiber typing in, in birds. And finally, Reviter, um, Dr. Bocci referred to him earlier, 2017 paper. Uh, Dr. Bocci was one of the et alls on this paper. And, and Reviter was really the one that went in and confirmed the fact that 
Um, you had mitochondria, more, less mitochondria in the pectoralis major uh, than you had in other tissues. But they also showed the fact that uh, breast muscle mitochondria content was negatively correlated with breast muscle yield. So what they saw, or excuse me, yeah, negative correlated with breast muscle yield. So low breast muscle mitochondrial content was associated with more muscular birds. So again, we're increasing the pectoralis major size uh, during the course of selecting for yield, but we're actually decreasing mitochondrial content, which will lead to me a hypothesis later in terms of some of these relationships contributing to the development of some of our anomalies. I don't often actually have a written script for talks, but I want to make sure I stayed on time and I covered the, uh, the pertinent points in this, so please excuse me as I go through this. Um, the next slide is a, is a very common slide showing the, the process of pH drop post-harvest. Um, we go from a top of about 6.3 to 6.4, we see a very, very rapid drop in pH until we eventually get out. Most of the rapid drop is occurring here. Most of the rapid drop is occurring here in the first hours until finally about 24 hours later we have our ultimate pH. And you can see this light gray line here represents a slight delay in the pH decline in carcasses that are actually refrigerated immediately post-harvest. So it just basically shows that if you do have a somewhat higher temperature that will accelerate the glycolytic process. What I really want to point out here, however, everywhere but the slide, what I want to appear, however, is look at the variability along each of your points in pH decline. And this variability was actually used to develop two lines, a high pH line and a low pH line. So you can see that in the high pH line, and I believe this was after six generations of selection, you had no differences in body weight, you had no differences in breast yield, no differences in abdominal fat. But what you do see are major differences in glycolytic potential, ultimate pH, and all of these indices of, of breast muscle quality. So I think it just emphasizes there's so much variability, in this case in pH decline, that you can actually have a strong genetic component. And what you're essentially doing here is you're creating one set of birds which have a PSC type condition and another set of birds which have a DFD. But it just emphasizes that the role of mitochondria, the role of post-harvest um, pH decline is very, very important in product quality. But I would also take from this that this also has a reference to pre-harvest tre treatment of birds. For instance, if you can accelerate glycolysis of glycogen prior to, prior to harvest through heat treatment or things of this sort, it's really important that it is just a process of processing in which we get our pH declines the glycogen will also be metabolism, will also be metabolized before harvest. So I want to transition now to a picture's worth a thousand words, okay? And I'm sure that you've seen many, many pictures um, over time of the genetic increases. Jerry Havenstein has a picture that people often cite. This came from Chang. And I want to make this the, um, the transition here. Um, that you can easily see the genetic increases we've had in carcass yield with time. And you can see here again the somewhat disproportional increase in the pectoralis major. What I have at the bottom of this slide is one of the current hypotheses. This came from a paper by Petracci and by Russo, 2015, that the increase in incidence of breast muscle myopathies is a result of selection for body weight and extremes in phenotype in terms of breast muscle phenotype. This was a paper by Bailey in 2015. Um, Bailey was an avigen geneticist. It's a very busy slide. Again, what they did was they had two lines, a line A and a line B, big differences in body weight, in parentheses here are some differences in age. What I want to point out here is for each of these traits, body weight, carcass weight, breast yield, deep pectoral myopathy percentage, green muscle disease, which I'll be describing a little bit later, woody breast and white striping, that the fast growing line with the great increase in breast yield had an increased incidence in these myopathies. And again, the slow growing line, the levels were much lower. 
What these values represent in parentheses are number of observations. So certainly the authors certainly had a lot of observations from which they came up with their conclusions. One of the conclusions in this paper was that the genetic correlations between breast muscle myopathies, body weight, and breast yield were very, very low. So they concluded that future selection for body weight, breast yield, would not necessarily increase the risk for the expression of breast muscle myopathies. One of the things I want to point out, however, is that breast yield is a ratio. It's a weight of the weight of the muscle over either body weight or carcass weight. And one of the things that's been missing in some of our papers is the fact that we don't feel necessarily it's the weight of the muscle. And this is what I want to uh, spend the rest of my presentation on. But it's the components and it's the conformation of that muscle that contributes to weight that is really the critical potential predictor of some of these myopathies. So again, we've developed a hypothesis um, that a lot of the onset of the pectoralis major breast muscle myopathies is a result of what we call compartment syndrome. Now, compartment syndrome was first identified by Siller. This is a Siller paper, 1985, which was actually a paper that came from a poultry science symposium in 85. Siller referred back to work with Martindale and others back in the late 70s. And you can see here in the quote, supracoracoideous muscle lies in a rigid compartment. So right here is the pectoralis minor. It lies in a rigid compartment. On the one side, you have the sternum. On the other side, you have the pectoralis overriding major. And what they basically said that at this time in the late 70s, deep pectoral myopathy was most commonly observed in turkeys. Martindale actually went in and did some very, very neat work in terms of actually surgically ablating some of the blood supply of the muscle and was able to very clearly show the ontogeny of a deep pectoral myopathy-like condition. So what Siller et al. came up with was the reason for this was this muscle couldn't go anywhere after exertion. It increased 20% in time, 20% in size, but there was nowhere for it to go. So you had a pooling of blood, it could not be drained out. You eventually had an ischemia followed by a necrosis. So this really has been the model that Siller proposed has been the base of what we have really been working on with our work on breast muscle myopathies. Now to get into compartment syndrome a little bit, we need to understand that within a developing muscle, we have several layers of what I call inelastic fascia. At the level of the independent fiber, okay, we have endomycium, epimycium surrounds the entire muscle, the paramycium basically is surrounding muscle fiber bundles. All of these are contiguous collagen layers. And the reason I have this slide here is it basically emphasizes that each of these different levels of fascia, connective tissue, surrounding the fiber, the muscle fiber bundles, and the entire muscle are really very inelastic and can be very stiff. So we know we've had tremendous increases in selection for muscle size. There's been a tremendous amount of work looking at satellite cells, their contribution to muscle size, muscle regeneration. But what I want to remind you is that a lot of the satellite cell work has been done in vitro. And satellite cells in the muscle itself do not operate in a vacuum. And I was really excited yesterday when I was listening to Jessica Starkey from Auburn talk about some of her work and her attempts really to kind of look at proliferation of satellite cells in vivo, uh, because I really think that's where we need to look at this process of muscle growth and muscle regeneration, because our hypothesis is that it's the regeneration process after an original necrosis that's leading to some of our, our myopathies. So Mary Decker, unless you're an ardent track and field fan, or you're old enough to be on the AARP listserv, you may not have heard of Mary Decker. She was the queen of track and field back in the 70s. Mary Decker had compartment syndrome. And when Jackie Griffin was talking about compartment syndrome in some of our lab meetings, it 
you know, it, it struck a, a bell somewhere in the back of my mind, and I realized that back from my day as a runner, the Mary Decker had compartment syndrome. It almost derailed her career. Her calf muscles were so big that they were pressing up against the sheath to the point where she could not run. She did in 1977. She had a somewhat rare surgery where they actually went in and they slit the sheath on her calves. It allowed the muscle to expand. The sheath repaired itself and she went on to have a, a fab fabulous career in the early 80s in track and field. So again, it's just another example of where this compartment syndrome, this inelastic fascia that doesn't allow muscle to expand, in this case causes an awful lot of pain. But chickens with breast muscle myopathies don't have the option of getting their sheath slit. Um, so we need to think in terms of how to develop the bird so they can actually have muscle expansion basically coordinated with the muscle sheaths. Now this paper right here is from a review by Mann, 2011. And it really fits very, very well into the hypothesis we've generated. Now this is in mice, and we need to realize that a lot of really good muscle growth and muscle repair work is not done in poultry species. But, but basically what Mann summarized was that and these are dystrophic muscle, and what he shows here is what he calls a chronic injury. So you have a, a chronic and a dystrophic muscle, a chronic sublevel of inflammation. As this inflammation persists, you start then getting some cells coming in, some leukocytes, and ultimately you get accumulation in collagen deposition, secondary to this chronic inflammation. So it's not the same thing as in the above panel where it's an acute injury. And again, this somewhat supports, if you look at my summary down here, the satellite cell population is either exhausted over time or loses the capacity for repair. And the muscle tissue progressively is replaced by adipose and fibrotic tissue. And isn't this very similar to what we're seeing, at least visually, in what's happening in our breast muscle myopathies? We do have this inflammation over time. We do have some ischemia, some necrosis occurring, followed by an appearance of lipid and also fibrosis or collagen during the repair process. So again, I think that some of the models that we want to look at, we would be well served to go into the human or the, the, the other species where they have using other models to try to explain what we're seeing in chickens. So again, this is a slide from Jackie Griffin's uh, original proposal for her PhD based on compartment syndrome. And basically what it shows is the fact you have an increase in intermuscular pressure. This increased intermuscular pressure basically from the, any, from the, uh, the inflexible epimysium and paramysium goes in one of two directions. You can either have it go down here to restricted mud flow, blood flow and ischemia or decrease in oxygen transport to the tissue and a localized hypoxia. From this original insult, again, you get increase in hypoxia, you get down, you actually have an increase in calcium infiltration, altered calcium homeostasis in the muscle, uh, oxidative stress, ultimately an immune response, followed by alter, altered cellular repair and the fibrosis condition. So again, our, putting together here our hypothesis that we have a compartment-like syndrome occurring in this muscle leading to our myopathies. So what Jackie did, she ran a large experiment. Um, we put birds in 27 and 9 pens. And from two days through 46 days, we sampled birds every other day. She noticed her first incidence of white striping at about 16 days. So from 16 days through 46 days, she took pictures of each muscle, and these are actually just images that she developed for presentation purposes. But we had a rank one, which was a mild case of white striping, superficial hemorrhages, much deeper hemorrhages, and then fibrosis, white striping, and, and necrotic tissue. So from 16 days to 46 days, each muscle that she sampled, 27 each day, she gave one of these ranks. And you can see they had quite a large end number from 77 and our rank four. 
found 86 in our rank one. We had to terminate the experiment at 46 days because our birds had such a high incidence of white striping that it really became a welfare concern for us. Within each of these, with each of these, these muscles, she measured these 10 parameters. Parameters are pectoralis major depth, yield, weight, body weight, pectoralis minor weight, width, length. And within each of these then, you can see that as you went from a, a rank one to a rank four, there were significant differences as you went up in rank in each of these parameters. We ran all possible two-way correlations and any correlations that were greater than 6.5, we did not use those values in our ultimate model generation, just so we wanted to have independent, we wanted to establish the independence of the individual traits without confounding the effects of, of two-way correlations. What I want to point out here is we ran all possible independent variables, created all possible models, and these are the top 10 models that we were generated. The thing I want to point out here is the numbers are not important. But the weight of the pectoralis major was only important in one of the 10 predicted models. Body weight was not a significant factor in any of the 10 best models. So certainly this partially supports the Bailey hypothesis that certainly sucking for body weight, continued sucking for body weight, probably is not going to have a strong effect, predictive effect, or correlated effect on breast muscle myopathies. And the weight of the major is probably not a major factor as well. But what we did find in these, in these models were that pectoralis major depth, pectoralis minor width, and pe pectoralis major yield were our three largest predictors of increasing in rank score. So what I want to point out here is this is our rank one. As we increase muscle depth, okay, it gave us a, give, a given predictor for the predisposition for breast muscle myopathies. So again, it gets back to the point that it is the structure, the topography, so to speak, of this muscle that is having the greatest effect on the predisposition for myopathy. And then really, this is supported in the literature by some of the folks that have actually been looking at woody breast in the sense of the fact that the thickest part of the muscle, as I pointed out, up near the sternum, okay, in that flight muscle, the thickest part of the muscle is usually where we see the, the initial ontogeny and progression of the defect. But the other thing she found was that, and again, I want to point out initially here that these bars, the color in these bars are backwards, okay? So this should be our rank one here, and that should be our rank four. Because what this is saying is that the increase in values of each of these factors increases the odds of falling in a lower rank. So what I'm saying here is, is we're going from a pectoralis major length of almost 14 up to, six, up to 17. The longer the muscle, the greater the odds that you will have a rank of one or two or a less severe rank. Whereas up here, pectoralis major depth, the deeper or thicker the muscle. And remember, all of these observations are between 16 and 46 days. Okay, so this really covers a wide range of muscles in this. It's not simply a fixed time when you have 10 normal birds and 10 myopathic birds. Myopathic birds. So again, pectoralis major width, pectoralis major length, the wider and the longer the muscle, the greater the chance you will not have one of these myopathies, you'll be in one of the lower ranks. So we think again, um, with technology out there, we need to develop a way of actually assessing muscle depth, cranial muscle depth. And we think this would be one of the factors we could use as a predictor. So one of my last couple of slides, what I want to point out is that um, we went to some, we used a nanostring technology, which is basically allows us to um, Jackie isolated the RNA from all of these different muscles at all the ages. And I just want to point out that here we have hypoxia inducible factor one alpha. Here we have carbonic anhydrase, and this is decorin. 
Now, if you read the papers by Muterin and the group from Delaware and a couple of the other papers in the literature, they've shown pretty conclusively that genes associated with oxidative stress are, are, are much higher in myopathic birds versus normal birds. What we're finding here is that, again, this covers all the ages we had. So this is actually two through 46 days for each of these three, each of these three proteins. And remember that our ranks were only generated from 16 to 46 days. So what I want to point out here is that I don't know why we're seeing this significant decline in hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha until about 11 to 14 days. But beginning at this point, you start seeing a linear increase in HIF1 alpha. Again, an indices of oxidative stress beginning. Carbonic anhydrase has been pointed out by a number of authors, muterin being one, as actually HIF1-alpha actually induces carbonic anhydrase. This is muscle-specific carbonic anhydrase. So again, everything I'm showing here is consistent with the literature in the sense of upregulated cytokines or upregulated proteins associated with oxidative stress. The thing that we're showing, however, is that some of this upregulation of these genes associated with oxidative stress are occurring well before we're starting to see some of our first myopathies occurring. So we think this is getting back to that mouse, that mouse data and that mouse picture I showed you. We think this supports the concept of a low-grade inflammation and a low-grade ischemia and oxidative stress in these muscles. As the bird gets older and gets heavier, it progressively you get into a more myopathic condition. But it's beginning at a young age, as suggested here by protein upregulation. And again, here, decorin. Um, and again, Sandy Bellman has shown that in woody breast tissue versus normal tissue, you have an increase in decorin expression. Um, decorin is a uh, heparin proteoglycan, uh, very, very important in collagen crosslinking. Okay, it works with FGF2 at increasing collagen crosslinking. And so what we think is happening here, and you can see this is our number four rank, we think what's happening here is, again, supporting the concept of low-grade inflammation ongoing at younger ages and increasing, that decorin basically is responding to the hypoxia. We're having a necrosis, we're having a repair process here, in which case a lot of our woody breasts or our collagen is actually the result of muscle repair, muscle fibrosis increasing. So really, our transcription data here falls in line with what's in the literature. What we're showing here, and I think the significance of our data, is that we're starting to see an insult occurring within the tissue itself before we're actually seeing clinical or phenotypic signs of muscle myopathy. So basically, this is just a more complicated picture of Jackie's hypothesis, pointing out the processes that are occurring in normal muscle we have ischemia, we have oxidative stress, and then we have essentially disaggregation of muscle that's appearing in many of the histologic types of things associated with these muscle myopathies. And that fibrosis really is part of the repair process that is then leading to the woody part of the woody breast. And we really need to look at these earlier stages before the phenotypic signs are occurring to really understand and possibly address what is driving our muscle down this road. So with that, we've made a lot of progress. Um, I think the real question now is, um, how do we solve this? We need to be able to predict it first. Um, we, I do think significantly that there is a genetic relationship here. We need to incorporate into selection programs, and it's easy for me to say because I'm a nutritionist, but we need to have some handle on the, the phenotypic depth width of the muscle and not just the weight of the muscle. We need to take into consideration how it's developing, where the stresses are occurring as we move forward. Because we certainly have a market out there that's not going to allow us to take a lot of muscle off. Breast yield, breast muscle are still very, very important. But I think we could rearrange the form of this muscle and possibly help ameliorate some of these myopathies. Thank you very much.